Welcome to another episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. In this episode, we will discuss the Star Trek fan film project, Star Trek Axanar, and the fallout that took place between those who created it and the current owner of the Star Trek name and franchise, CBS Studios and Paramount Pictures. Now, what I want to do is dive right into the rules that were created in the wake of the Star Trek Axanar lawsuit brought against Star Trek Axanar Productions and its creator, Alec Peters, by CBS and Paramount Pictures. Because I believe that many have ignored or do not truly understand just how draconian and oppressive these rule sets truly are and how they stand poised to threaten the future of independent, fan-made Star Trek films especially those that are released and produced for the internet. So let's begin, uh, therefore, with the reading of the rules, and I'm going to add my own individual commentary to these rules as we go. These rules, by the way, are available at StarTrek.com forward slash fan, F-A-N, dash, films, F-I-L-M-S. So again, they are available. These rules are available at StarTrek.com forward slash fan dash films okay and you can read them for yourself and I will post a link in the low bar or in the description box so you can read these uh, these these rules for yourselves and when you do read these rules for yourself I really want you to go through and dissect what it is you're seeing so let's begin rule number one The fan production must be less than 15 minutes for a single self-contained story or no more than two segments, episodes, or parts, not to exceed 30 minutes total, with no additional seasons, episodes, parts, sequels, or remakes. Now let's break this down. This rule simply means that any new fan-created Star Trek film, be it for the internet, or I would presume even something that is not created for the internet, something that was done for, I don't know, a theatrical production, something that is done for school play even. It must be only 15 minutes or less if it is a single self-contained story, or if the story is longer than 15 minutes, it must be broken down into two parts so that each part does not go beyond 15 minutes, and the total length of each part together cannot exceed 30 minutes. Thereafter, it cannot have any more parts or follow-ups. Now this means that if your story is originally 45 minutes in length total, number one, you must cut it down 15 minutes from the total length in order to make it satisfy the 30 minute requirement or less. And number two, it must be broken down into two 15 minute segments each in order for it to comply with this rule. That is my understanding of what this rule means. Now this might be okay for a story that is 35 or 40 minutes in length, but if your story is one hour long, or one and a half or two hours long, well now you can begin to see how your story would be severely cut and drastically affected by such a measure. Furthermore, you could not follow up with the extra material by creating a sequel of any kind, to do to make what didn't uh, to uh, further uh, extrapolate or explain what didn't make it into the original film this means that all of the extra material that you you filmed would be cut forever from the final story with no opportunity period at all to continue that story at another time so the one and a half extra hours out of a two hour film or the one hour out of an extra one hour out of a one hour and 30 minute film all that extra material goes away you might as well just shelve it and scrap it and never have done it in the first place now this will already have a severe effect on star trek web series like star trek new voyages star trek continues star trek phase two Aurora and several other ventures that are already being planned or that are already already in existence. Second rule. The title of the fan film or the title of the fan production or any parts cannot include the name Star Trek. However, the title must contain must contain a subtitle with the phrase a Star Trek fan production in plain typeface. 
the fan production cannot use the term official, quote unquote official, in either of its in either its title or subtitle or in any marketing, promotions, or social media for the fan production. Now, in other words, you can no longer call your story Star Trek Continues, a fan film web series that actually exists, or Star Trek Phase 2, another fan film production that actually exists on the internet. It must now be called Aurora, a Star Trek fan production, or Pacific 21, a Star Trek fan film production. One fan, one of those actually already exists, my understanding, that's Aurora, and the other one, Pacific 21, is a production that is currently underway that will now have to conform to these rules if it wishes to be seen at all without the possibility of being sued by Paramount Pictures and CBS. Now this is meant to ensure that CBS and Paramount Pictures and anyone else that sees your product uh, that it is not formally associated with the official product and is therefore in no competition with them in any way. Rule number three. The content in the fan production must be original, not reproductions, recreations, or clips from any Star Trek production. If non-Star Trek third-party content is used, all necessary permissions for any third-party content should be obtained in writing. Now this means that you cannot recreate or reproduce in any way scenes, clips, audio, or anything else from any of the thousands of hours of Star Trek movies, TV shows, books, audiobooks, or any other official Star Trek production created or sanctioned by Paramount or CBS from all the way from the original series in 1966 to the present in 2017 or in the future. Now this might sound fine on the surface, but say for instance you want to recreate the iconic Spock death scene in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan because you want to do a film where Spock did not die you are now prohibited from creating such a scene or replicating that scene in any way because it can from now on be considered an infringement of the CBS and Paramount Pictures Star Trek copyright and their intellectual property. Okay. Furthermore, with the notion that if you have to get a non-Star Trek third party content, uh, you have to get that in writing, that simply guarantees uh, that if you use anybody else's content, I don't know, say if you want to put something from Babylon 5, a Babylon 5 Star Trek crossover, or that other great house of science fiction, Star Wars. If you want to make a Star Trek Star Wars crossover, you now have to get their permission in writing before you go forward with your fan film project. This just ensures that uh, Paramount Pictures wants to make sure that its butt is covered, while ostensibly making it look like you are covering your butt as well at the same time. Uh, when you're doing these fan film projects, even though these fan film projects, they say, as they say later on, have no affiliation whatsoever with Paramount Pictures or CBS Studios whatsoever. But let's continue. Rule number four. If the fan production uses commercially available Star Trek uniforms, accessories, toys, and props, these items must be officially be, must be official merchandise and not bootleg items or imitations of such commercially available products. So, those hand-sewn uniforms your aunt was going to make for you, the ones that you meticulously studied from every angle of every episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, the ones you were going to use to reenact Captain Picard's capture by the Borg in the best of both worlds and then put that film on the internet, you can't use your aunt's hand-sewn uniforms anymore. You must now go and buy officially licensed uniforms, officially licensed phasers and tricorders, guaranteeing that CBS and Paramount receives a cut, directly or indirectly, from the materials you use in the creation of your film. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that is nothing less than pure, unadulterated greed. It means that well, maybe those star uniforms from uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, you couldn't hand make those uniforms anymore. Not either could you get them made by somebody who is not officially licensed to sell that material from Star Trek or CBS and Paramount Pictures anymore. Such as the uniform that I have myself that was made many years ago by an independent contractor. I couldn't use that uniform anymore in any fan production that I might choose to make in the future. I would have to go and officially buy from an officially licensed dealer or some other individual who is officially licensed by Paramount. I would have to go and buy my uniforms and other props and materials 
from such individual or individuals or groups or companies who would be recognized by CBS and Paramount Pictures. As I said, nothing less than pure, unadulterated greed. Rule number five. The fan production must be a real, quote-unquote, fan production, i.e. creators, actors, and all other participants must be amateurs, cannot be compensated for their services, and cannot be currently or previously employed on any Star Trek series, films, production of DVDs, or with any of CBS or Paramount Pictures licensees. This means you can no longer have people like J.G. Hertzler, Tim Russ, Walter Koenig, Nichelle Nichols, Tony Todd, or any other current or former Star Trek actor in your production. But this goes further than just the big names like the ones I've, just, I've mentioned. This new rule means you cannot even have supporting actors who have appeared in Star Trek before all the way back to the original series and onward. Several Star Trek internet series have already done this like Star Trek Continues by way of example. But under this new rule, they can no longer do this without threat of legal action against them by CBS and Paramount. And this applies even if the actors in question volunteered their talents without being paid or compensated for the work on your film in any way. Indeed, you cannot have any professional actor in your story, not just Star Trek actors, any professional actor in your story at all. And the amateur actors cannot be monetarily compensated for their work or presumably offered gifts that may be considered compensation for their participation. Furthermore, this rule is ambiguous enough in its language to suggest that not only are professional actors excluded from fan films, but so are professional makeup artists, cameramen, and other production personnel. Rule number six, the fan production must be non-commercial. CBS and Paramount Pictures do not object to limited fundraising for the creation of a fan production, whether one or two segments and consistent with these guidelines, so long as the total amount does not exceed $50,000, including all platform fees, and when the $50,000 goal is reached, all fundraising must cease. So if your production uh, costs $70,000, well then, maybe you better find a way to shave that extra $20,000 off. The fan production must only be exhibited or distributed on a no-charge basis and or shared via streaming services without generating revenue. So the film that costs you $50,000 to make, you can't make a single cent off of it whatsoever. The fan production cannot be distributed in any physical format, such as DVD or Blu-ray. So this means that you cannot create copies even to give away to anyone, much less sell to anyone. The fan production cannot be used to derive advertising revenue, including but not limited to through, for example, the use of pre- or post-roll advertising, click-through advertising banners that is associated with the fan production. Now, if I interpret it this right, this means that you can't use film clips or internet banners to help raise revenue to create the film, or and both, but certainly not to have post-production revenue of any kind. Okay. Continuing, no unlicensed Star Trek related or fan produced related merchandise or services can be offered for sale or given away as premiums, perks, or rewards or in connection with the fan production fundraising. This means you cannot offer incentives for people to help fund or promote your film, including offering them DVDs, soundtracks for your film, scripts for the film, subscriptions of any kind, or any other type of perks that you may choose to, uh, that you can imagine or may choose to offer. Continuing on, the fan production cannot derive revenue by selling or licensing fan-created production sets, props, or costumes. As we've discussed before, those hand-sewn costumes your aunt made that we mentioned, you could not sell those to fans once your film was complete, either as the way to make some money back for the production of your film, nor as souvenirs for interested parties. Number seven, the fan production must be family friendly and suitable for public presentation. Videos must not include profanity, nudity, obscenity, pornography, depictions of drugs, alcohol, tobacco, or any harmful or illegal activity, or any material that is offensive, fraudulent, defamatory, libelous, disparaging, sexually explicit, threatening, hateful, or any other inappropriate content. The content of the fan production cannot violate any individual's right to privacy. 
Well, you know, quite frankly, that's a big catch-all for basically telling you that uh, you can't do anything that somebody might consider offensive. But this would basically kind of lock out just about any number of fan productions that might be out there that somebody could consider offensive to their religious, sexual uh, orientation, uh, or any other kind of particular uh, or political orientation, or any other kind of particular gripe that they may have uh, within the world. So... Those, for example, those uh, semi-naked Orion slave girls that you would want to put in your Star Trek fan film, that could be considered uh, potentially offensive and non-family friendly and not suitable for public presentation by CBS or Paramount Pictures if they so choose. That phaser that you, you break out on your set and use it to shoot the Klingons, well, that's considered a little too violent. And so because those Klingons got vaporized, that's a little too offensive too. That can be considered to be... Um, uh, just a little bit uh, too offensive uh, and, ex and and violently explicit or harmful. Uh, so you might as well just leave that out of your fan fiction uh, film as well. It's a catch-all uh, for anything, quite frankly. And it leaves a tremendous gap and tremendous loophole for CBS and Paramount Studios, Paramount Pictures, to uh, uh, basically shut down a film at its leisure, should it choose to do so. Number eight. The fan production must display the following disclaimer in the on-screen credits of the fan productions and on any marketing material including the fan production website or page hosting the fan production. That uh, following disclaimer is this. Star Trek and all related marks, logos, and characters are solely owned by CBS Studios and Company. This fan production is not endorsed by, sponsored by, nor affiliated with CBS, Paramount Pictures, or any other Star Trek franchise, and is an, a non-commercial, fan-made film intended for recreational use. No commercial exhibition or distribution is permitted. No alleged independent rights will be asserted against CBS or Paramount Pictures." End quote. Well, quite frankly, once again, here's another uh, catch-all. Uh, which basically is telling anyone who makes the film and anyone who watches the film that Star Trek uh, is Paramount Pictures and CBS's property. That even this film can at some point, if, start, if, if Paramount Pictures and CBS so chooses, your independent fan film can be considered the property of Paramount and CBS Studios. And you will have no claim whatsoever over your own property. Now let's go further because that is actually backed up by the following rule, by, by the subsequent rule that follows. Rule number nine. Creators of fan productions must not seek to register their works nor any element of their works under copyright or trademark law. Here again, this is probably one of the most egregious rules out of all of these draconian rules. Here you cannot take full control of your own intellectual property to ensure it is not misused or unaccredited by those who did not create it. And in the full scheme of things, if you really think about this, this means that if CBS or Paramount sees your production and chooses to use it in whole or in part, you cannot sue them for unauthorized use of your intellectual property. You cannot uh, demand compensation for the use of your intellectual property. And should CBS or Paramount so choose, you would not even be given accreditation for the use of your intellectual property. Which means that if you create something that they choose to make uh, into a new movie, or they choose to make into a new television series, or they choose to make into a new audio book, or even have some uh, some writer write or incorporate into his or her stories. They do not have to give you any kind of compensation or credit whatsoever for the creation of that work. Your intellectual property, according to CBS and Paramount Studios, once you make a fan, a fan film labeled a Star Trek fan film production, it really does not belong to you anymore. Number 10. Fan productions cannot create or imply any association or endorsement by CBS or Paramount Studios. So while CBS and Paramount have the ability to steal your work and use it how they see fit, if they so choose to do so, you are in no way to insinuate or imply any endorsement by CBS and Paramount in the creation of your film. CBS and Paramount Pictures reserve the right to revise, revoke, and or withdraw these guidelines at any time in their own discretion. These guidelines are not a license and do not constitute approval or authorization of any fan productions or a waiver of any rights that CBS or Paramount Pictures may have with respect to fan fiction created outside of these guidelines. 
I think that last uh, uh, paragraph speaks for itself. But I will end this by telling you that I think that these rules are draconian. That is, they are tyrannical on their face. And they are virtually guaranteed to stifle all existing or new fan film productions that might be in the works. And if I may say so, I don't think that these rules, strictly interpreted as they are, can necessarily just only apply to films that are created for the internet. In my opinion, if you loosely interpret these rules, they can apply to fan films that are uh, fan created products, uh, that fan productions that are created for television, like maybe uh, uh, access television productions that you might put on, you know, maybe some of your, uh, you know, access TV, local TV programs, local TV shows, local TV networks, that is. They can apply to theater productions. Let's say you decide uh, a local theater company wants to put on some uh, production for uh, a Star Trek, a lo uh, Star Trek for a local theater group. It could apply to those types of productions, and it could even apply to productions that are created and uh, people that uh, productions that are privately created, and say you want to distribute them uh, to uh, local groups in your local area. Okay, without Paramount's without Paramount or CBS's permission. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Star Trek fans, I believe that these are the kinds of things that that are virtually guaranteed, as I said, to stifle any new fan film production that is in the work and any new any fan film production that is currently in existence, such as Star Trek Continues or Star Trek Phase Two, etc., etc. Now, sure, there will be many uh, uh, fan production teams who will try and work around these new rules and, and many who no doubt will succeed. However, speaking as one fan to the multitude of you, I do not believe we should simply accept and grow comfortable with these rules. Like a mental patient who eventually accepts and grows comfortable with the confinements of a straitjacket. I think we should fight back. And this means defying these rules and proceeding on with our own projects. And quite frankly, if it, if it means proceeding on with our own projects as we see fit and how we see fit, then so be it. Go forth. And number two, it means boycotting any new projects that's, that Paramount Pictures and CBS throw our way for consumption. Such as the new Star Trek Discovery show that is set to premiere later this year. Boycott it. Pay CBS All Access absolutely nothing to watch it. Let it tank. And in the process, let CBS know that we will not gladly suck off their poison teat and drink the poison milk of crap that they continue to feed us like Star Trek Into Darkness and Star Trek 2009 and Star Trek Beyond while they simultaneously try to stifle and curtail every attempt and effort we make to create products that we as fans enjoy and approve of and work so hard to deliver. This is absolutely asinine, and this is why I wanted to break down these rules for you so that you can see just how draconian and how restricting these rules really are. These rules are not designed to uh, help you as, as fans create uh, quality products. They are designed to make sure that you are not in competition with CBS and Paramount Pictures with the products that they continue to deliver to us in Star Trek's name. And while they continue to create multi-million dollars worth of garbage, they want you to be curtailed and hemmed in by these rules that will ensure that you can forever create nothing but inferior products so that you will never be able to compete successfully with them again and be forced to accept the crap that they give you instead and that you will be forced to pay for it even as you are forced to consume it. Enough is enough. Now, I'm not going to say a whole lot about Star Trek Axanar, which was the precipitation of all of these events. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, leave for you uh, in the description box several links to articles that talk about the entire Star Trek Axanar phenomenon and how this was the, the genesis of what started all of this. And whether you agree with Alec Peters and the Star Trek Axanar uh, phenomenon, its position or not, whether you think that that is a quality production or not, that is beside the point. 
What is going on here is that the bottom line of what happened with Star Trek Axanar was that it was the the genesis, if you will, of a of an independent Star Trek fan made fan made film that had the potential to rival anything that Paramount Pictures has done and CBS Studios has done thus far in its modern uh, uh, takeover or its modern uh, its modern uh, uh, assumption of the Star Trek universe. It had the, that is Star Trek Axanar had the potential to rival uh, anything that the major studios have put out so far, and it was necessary therefore for Paramount Pictures to reassert its control after all of this time over these independent uh, independent Star Trek fan films by making an example of Axanar, and making sure that no one else who came after Axanar or who is currently uh, following on the heels of Axanar, making sure that none of them would be able to do what Axanar has done either. I don't think we need to accept this garbage anymore. These rule sets here, whether you think Axanar again was, was a quality product or not, or something worthwhile or not, or whether Alec Peters had a legal leg to stand on or not. What I don't really think is debatable, however, is how these new rules are meant to curtail real competition from emerging within the fan community against the major studios and their helmsmanship of the Star Trek universe in the modern times. I think we need to fight back. And again, I say boycott Star Trek Discovery. Boycott any new Star Trek films, studio films, major studio films by Paramount Pictures and CBS that are produced in the future. Until these rules are rescinded, and until they uh, res show respect and, and, and loyalty for the fans who have helped make this franchise what it is, and quite frankly who have kept this fledgling franchise alive for more than 50 years, they do not need or deserve any more money or loyalty from us. Fellow Star Trek fans, I urge you to follow those in the footsteps of those of us like myself and others who have decided that we do not want to put up with this foolishness any longer. This should be a final straw because they are now telling you this is a big, quite frankly, this is a big F you to the Star Trek film community, the fan film community, and to Star Trek fans as a whole. Will you put up with it? Will you accept it? Or will you tell them if they're going to tell you to bend over while you take it up the back, up your butt, then you're going to tell them to kiss your butt before they do it. I don't like using crude language in my, uh, in my commentary, so I try to avoid it. But I think some of these crudeness of language appropriately illustrates what it is we're dealing with here. And I think it helps get to the point and helps some of you see the point of what is happening to us as we continue to accept this foolishness over and over and over again. By way of contrast, for example, I have never seen Star Wars treat its fans with this kind of contempt and disrespect. It's Star Trek because someone dares to create a product that could has the potential to be not only rival, but be superior to their own Hollywood-made garbage. Star Trek dares to raise a hand against us and backslap us in the face. And yet we will still continue to accept it because it has the Star Trek label on it. No, no, hell no. This has been another discussion by Continuum Meditations. Until next time, Star Trek fans, live long and prosper.